All right, well, thanks everyone, and welcome back to another episode of What's a Wolpert. As always, we have Ben Blumenscheid with us, and today we're excited for a kind of a back to school uh, ish edition of our podcast. And we have David Sturtz and Jessica Goodell. And so, what we usually ask folks to do is kind of quickly tell us where you're at, what you do um, for Wolpert, and kind of what your daily tasks are. Jessica, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, my name is Jessica Goodell, and I'm located in Dallas, Texas. I sit in the consult strategic consulting group, and I lead facility condition assessments and other kind of portfolio optimization exercises. Um, my real portfolio has been in high- K-12 and a little bit of higher education, leading large facility condition assessments across the country for some pretty big school districts. Um, probably for about the last 10 years. And a lot of that has been done um, alongside David and his master planning expertise. Cool. Thanks, Jessica. Well, that was a nice tee up. Um, yeah. And uh, my name is David Sturz with Wolpert. We joined Wolpert in the summer from Cooperative Strategies, recent acquisition. As mentioned, Jessica and I have done work hand in glove for about 10 years around the country. Um, my focus in that time has been on the, the master planning element, a lot of what leads to and feeds a bond ask by districts around the country, school districts mainly. Um, so I help oversee those projects that we do uh, across the country that uh, will ultimately usually lead to a bond or a significant funding need uh, request for school districts. And you're physically located where, David? Physically in Ohio, um, okay. Columbus, Ohio, but you know, in our office, we say we're located in Terminal B of Fort Columbus International Airport because <laughs> um, we kind of service everywhere. OK, sounds good. So like I said, we try to pick things that are timely with current events or time of the year. So what are what are the trends this year for education and you know facilities in education? Like what are people either excited about or what are they you know, trying to tackle um, problem wise? You know what we've seen over the years in doing this, and it's it's just only building year over year, is you've got a real mismatch between budgets, uh, capital budgets and capital need. And that's just growing over time. You know, capital um, expenditures on public schools are the second largest infrastructure spend in our country next to roads, roads and bridges. Hmm. But a, over 80% of that's um, borne by local governments local school districts, local counties, local cities, um, less than 1% of that's federal. The rest is um, some states uh, provide some capital uh, outlay. Uh, so you just got this, you know, most of the buildings being built in the 50s, 60s, you know, they've reached their life cycle in many cases. And it's just uh, trying to figure out how to uh raise enough funds to take care of your needs when you can't reasonably do that to meet all of the needs. Your populations have moved. So we have buildings where we don't need them and some buildings less, too few buildings where we do uh, from a capacity mismatch. And um, so it sounds like funding is a a core problem. I mean, you're, you're basically saying you know, aging infrastructure, which is some other stuff we had teed up to kind of talk about, because it is probably the same problem as roads and bridges. I mean, the way in which kids learn these days, I think it's changed. And I think about the high school my daughter goes to, it's a very old building. It's completely different than probably the modern facilities that get built today. But you're saying the biggest challenge where you're working with clients is on the funding aspect to get, you know, the money secured to operate schools to today's standards. It's a funding and a mindset thing. You know, for for years, the schools um, didn't, you know, 70s, 80s, didn't 90s even didn't require a whole ton of investment because they were relatively young. Yeah. Um, and, and now they're not. And, um, you know, we've all seen the property or felt many of us have felt that property tax increase in the past few years in our, where we live um, just from because of inflation itself and property uh, values. Um, but the school districts, uh, the difference between the roads and bridges and schools is roads and bridges have require federal and state funding hmm. schools being the second largest bucket, the lion's share of that, in many cases, all of it have to come from the local constituents who simply cannot afford it in many ways. So it's an upside down 
triangle, if you will. It just doesn't, you've got all of these needs and a very little funnel in many, in many jurisdictions to, to pay for it. So how do you prioritize amongst all the needs? Um, schools have a lot of emotional value as we find. And um, sometimes that the investment in fixing it up isn't worth it relative to the value of the school, relative to what it offers kids, as you said, teaching and learning today is, is different than it was when these builds were, buildings were conceived. And the main thing that we see with that, and Jessica can speak to this, uh, not just on the condition side, but schools were built where kindergartners had about a thousand square foot rooms. And then you got into the 600 square feet as kids got older, because as bigger ki- as kids got older, even though they got bigger, they were expected to sit in rows. And so you've got a lot of schools with teeny weeny little classrooms and teachers are trying to do more than sit and get. Um, so there's an adequacy challenge on top of the um, condition itself. And yes, I have a dog. Who's oh, it's your dog this time, not mine. <laughs> we'll see if we can get the other dog talking a little bit, Jessica. <laughs> so I, I guess then, so Jessica, you mentioned facility condition assessments um, in your intro. So I'm assuming by presenting an assessment of the facilities, it, I would assume that's a good mechanism for achieving funding. Right. And so what, what we're able to do with the condition assessments, because we go through and we look at everything, their roofs, their walls, their windows, their air conditioners, and we're able to really have a data-driven process. Um, even when David mentions these smaller classrooms, we collect data on that. So we know how many classrooms are this big or that big and where their classrooms are undersized and they're cramming in extra students. So really by having it very unemotional, I guess, with the data, it helps them make good data-driven decisions on the baseline. And a lot of times people be like, wow, I didn't really realize our schools were so bad or, um, or something like that. And then you have to bring in the emotions, like the community sentiment. They really love this school. It might be in terrible condition, but they're just not going to replace it because everybody loves it or it's politically incorrect to replace it. Um, so we find ways to work around that as well, like with programs or something like that. But really working with data-driven decision-making takes that emotion out and people can really relate to that um, in the community because the community needs to understand, like David said, a lot of this is funding, right? So they go for bonds. So people are voting on that. And a lot of voters are a little older and they don't necessarily have children in school anymore. And so it's important for them to understand the condition of the schools to say, I, you know, I always kind of poke around a little bit. I'm, I'm a cartographer, geospatial person by education. So I don't, I don't know this stuff. So I, I looked around a little bit and I was very surprised at some of the data driven aspects of what you do, where you had it broken down by space types and building age and that kind of stuff. And it's funny, even as a parent, I don't, I don't think about when I go into a school, like, well, where's the STEM space? Where's the visual arts space? Where's the music space? Like whatever that might be. And I would assume And I guess it is hard because you have that very analytical thing. It's really cool to see. So people can say, oh, my gosh, athletics has this much more compared to that and and put it in front of people in a very non, I don't know what the word is, non-pointed way, right? It's just, it is what it is. I thought that was pretty interesting. I had no idea that that much sort of analysis went into kind of that that facility or the facility condition sort of analysis. And I'm not just talking about, hey, this is walls old or is a ceiling leaking. I'm talking about the space types designated per student. I, I thought that was quite interesting. And I'm, I'm going to, like I said, I, I think I'm an involved dad, but I'm guessing the average American doesn't understand how complex that is and, and the amount of data that you are collecting for that kind of stuff. Well, no. And I think David's stuff, like you said, the um, kind of the square foot per student and how it impacts students is far more um, like we had a school board meeting just Monday night. And David got a lot more questions than I did around how many kids can we cram in this school? And, you know, why is it overutilized or underutilized? And um, the condition assessments are are a little more tame because they are what they are. But you also have to be careful with, with the facilities and that you go and you replace, a you know, the mechanical system or the roof. But if the paint is still old and shabby, when you walk in your kid's school, you're like this, we spent how many million dollars on this? So you have to kind of balance how the school feels and, you know, fixing up the things that are required. So your kids does, you know, doesn't get leaked on while they're learning math or something, but David's stuff with the, the space types and the programming tends to get a lot more 
people fired it, up, I guess. It's all interconnected, you know, so you have um, school capacity, you know, how many kids can your, uh, can your school hold? Well, that was the question that came up on Monday night. Uh, and, you know, the answer is, well, how, how do you want to measure that? <laughs> um, if you measure it just based upon, you know, a classroom gets 22 kids, period. Okay. Then a 600 square foot classroom and a thousand square foot classroom both get 22 kids. But the 600 square foot classroom dictates how you will teach. And the thousand square foot classroom gives you options because of a square foot per student basis. If we were to use a square foot per student, we'd say a typical classroom should have 37 and a half square feet per student as a baseline. Um, and so if we did it that way, those two classrooms would get very different square footage capacity as opposed to saying they both get 22. So we were, we were discussing with the client is, um, yeah, we understand you feel full at a lot of these itty small, itty bitty little small elementary schools, for example. Um, but that's just because you have very little square foot per student relative to your new builds. Um, they programmatically can fit the same number of kids, but you can just do less. So, but, but you mentioned, you said a metric, I think is the word you used. So do we not have standards or are there not like OSHA rules that say you can't go below certain, I mean, to Jessica's point, like how many kids can you cram in a, what Fire are? code is, is really it. I mean, fire, code. Fire, okay. fire code will uh, it'll be your, your limiting factor, but that's not, you don't plan for fire code unless, you know, except in extreme circumstances. So no, there's not. So we've developed standards from doing this, um, you know, done about 50 of these similar plans across the country over time. And our, you know, people have worked with collective, we've done hundreds. And we've kind of just combined, you know, look at the standards from different states, uh, from different clients. And we've come to what we think are good baseline standards on a square foot per student by space type, art, is different than music is different well in different kinds of music choral band strings uh what's the square foot per student that needed at the elementary middle and high uh and we apply those from a, a standards perspective uh on top of the program could get a program capacity to get an understanding of sort of the quantity of capacity and the quality of that capacity um for your kids where there are standards, like um, when we did work in the state of Rhode Island, they have standards. You have to build your classrooms however big. Mm -hmm. The schools built 50 years ago didn't have those same standards. And so, well, and I think a lot of districts or states do have some sort of standard now. It, they can't go back and undo the old facilities. So they're stuck with kind of the old facilities um, there. But a lot of them for new construction do have some sort of standard. At what point do you just determine you need to, you know, redo the whole thing i mean is there a is there a metric between hey this is retrofitable if that's a word um versus it is now just yeah thank you do you just i can only like level it but i'm assuming that must be an option on the table at some point i think you mentioned it david what point is it no longer cost effective to retrofit something that's you know 100 years old i mean is well, so that kind of comes out of the facility condition assessment. And when we do the facility condition assessment, we calculate a metric called the facility condition index. And it's the cost to repair the building divided by the cost to replace it. So it gives you like a metric to compare dissimilar facilities. Mm -hmm. And once that facility condition index reaches around 60, 65 percent, you're kind of at two thirds the cost to replace this building. So at that point, we we do we have these conversations. In some districts, we have it at fifty percent, because not only is your school, you know, really in poor condition, it's educationally inadequate. The classrooms are small. You know, they're doing art on a cart. They don't have enough electricity for their iPads. Um, and yeah, so then it comes up to hey, do we want to push this school over? Because it is better for financially, it's better, and educationally, it's better. So. The condition assessment kind of starts the conversation and then um, it has to get supported by other other things like the community sentiment. Some schools you just can't push over. It doesn't matter. They love that 1920s building. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, it's funny because when you mentioned that, it's exactly what I thought. There was an uproar that people say, oh, my gosh, this old, beautiful building. There's no way we should replace that. So they're currently right now retrofitting all kinds of stuff and putting little wings on it and things. But um, it's, you know, when you think about it that way, you have the funding, 
you have changing conditions, you have the, you know, the aging infrastructure, then you have that sort of uh, passion, the emotion tied to, which like a, it's a nice looking building I and mean, it's old, but it's not, I'm sure the AC is not very efficient or whatever, but you know, there are people are emotionally attached to it. Um, so I don't know. You, it would be nice if they were emotionally attached to the funding aspect of it too. But it sounds like from David's standpoint, that's not, they don't make that connection. <laughs> you can, you, and that, I mean, that's essentially our job. Okay. Is to take the data and to make the connection to this is what it means for you. When you, when you move into a new area, you ask anybody and you go in the community, you say, well, you know, why'd you pick your community? If you have kids, the answer is almost inevitably Number one or number two reason, I research the schools, right? If you have the capacity, if you have the ability to choose, if you have the wherewithal financially to choose, that's one of the first things you look at. And, and so people understand it intuitively many times that the quality of the school matters. Um, but as Jessica mentioned, and, and you alluded to, there's a lot of unknowns about these buildings and there's a lot of suppositions it was good for me i went there 50 years ago i got a great education yep. yeah and the building was 10 years old <laughs> whereas a lot of people may be on a knee-jerk moment without further information emotionally tied to a building because of its heritage or architecture what have you you present data that they didn't know about what's actually happening beneath the roof in, you know, on the inside of the walls mm -hmm. and how much that's going to cost to remedy relative to maybe a new school that could incorporate some of those stones and pay homage to the history. Mm -hmm. um, it, that changes minds. What you are painting the two of you is a very complex picture of making it a good decision that maybe half the community is actually tuned into. You know what I mean? It sounds like even, because when I looked at this and Jessica, you talked about the data-driven aspects to try to, I don't know what the word is, desensitize the discussion. But, you know, then you throw in all these other aspects, it gets, gets pretty wild pretty quickly. Oh, definitely. And there's a, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. And um, I don't know if, we were planning to talk about it, but one thing David's team does really well is these community engagement sessions where we bring the community in mm -hmm. and they are a part of the master planning process. We educate them on the data and what they, what we did and they inform the plan. Ultimately um, you do a school district in Texas and man, they want more football fields, right? They are all for their sports. You go somewhere else. That's not going to be the case. They want, you know, fine arts or whatever. And so they're able to inform the plan and then, um, they're part of that plan all the way along the process and creating the options and then the final recommendations that go to the school board, which they build that bond package on and then the community has to vote on. So we're able to build kind of this momentum behind the in, within the community to say, hey, this is a really great thing. I've been going to these meetings and you should come to more meetings. And this is why it's good for us. You know, um, yeah, we're landlocked, so our taxes are going to go up. But. Our, our property values are going to go up because people are going to want to come to our schools. And by involving them, you have a lot. Um, David, are you like, how successful are your bond programs? Like the ma very successful, 90% or majority. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The vast majority we're able to pass and it. It is because we're working. We take the like right now we're starting with a, um, a fresh client. We just started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, largest district in their state and looking at uh, a plan to uh, that would pr that will probably lead as we directed to the school board, you're looking at a need for a bond. Uh, they haven't passed a bond in 20 years and they've been relying on uh, levies to to fix, you know, the roof is the roof is leaking, fix it. You know, the carpet needs replaced, replace it, you know, tit for tat, ten of replacements. Um, but but you've got serious other considerations while you're doing those tit for tat replacements and re renovations, the entire infrastructure is getting more costly to operate. Big ticket items are building up that will gobble up or surpass the funding capacity. 
And they're not just doing it at one building, they're doing it in mass because many of them were built in the same era with the same materials and the same systems. So they're, they're, from the funding standpoint, that's just been ballooning under the surface uh, while they've been uh, repairing things. Um, and coupled with that is you have, you know, they have a good number of schools that are under 200 capacity. And to put that in perspective, there are states that simply that of the states that fund or provide matching funds to schools, um, several of them have a statute where they will not fund anything for a school under 350 capacity. Why? As we've worked with several districts in, in their uh, CFOs and operations folks and looking at it, you simply can't afford to operate a comprehensive school for much less than that because kids come with dollars. That's how the schools are funded. And once you get below a certain threshold, in many places it's 350, some places, some clients we work with, that minimum threshold for is like 700, 750. You can't afford to operate, not just the teachers, because that's, that's like the ground floor, right? But the counselors, the assistants, the interventionists, the APs, the SROs, if you have them, you know, all the other support staff that take on so much of that, what we, you know, today champion as a holistic education. Well, that requires staff. The teacher can't be Superman and Superwoman. They need these other staff to focus on their areas of expertise in, in, in helping every kid succeed every year and make adequate yearly progress. Uh, you can't afford that with super low enrollment. So there you've got, a, you've got the condition of these buildings ballooning, the capacity of them limiting to the, to the point of limiting um, not just how you teach in the classroom, if the classrooms are small, but who you can bring to bear to work with the kids and the resource wise, because yeah, a school district can afford to have one or two super small schools that they supplement the budget for, but you can't have 40% of your schools that small because now it's just financially inviolable. Yeah. Interesting. And it's funny, like as Jessica is describing, so you have these very intricate, hopefully intimate conversations with the staff in advance of the bond so that by the time the bond shows up, they're all in because they're the ones that crafted the bond that they're being asked to fund. Yeah, they're um, co-creators. Totally. So that's awesome. And <laughs> dare I say, we shy away from salesy talk, but to say that 90% success rate, I mean, that's pretty impressive and, and really shows the power of community engagement and probably some of the facility concession, you know, the less emotional sort of stuff as well. So I don't know. I mean, that, that's a pretty, I, I don't know how often you guys tout that number, but you know, when you have success rates of, I mean, that's an A in most grading scales, right? I mean, you guys are in education. So for a lot of, a lot of the times it is with this larger committee and some of our, when we work with the committee, one of our non-negotiables are we want high school students. Uh, when, when we get local business leaders, community college leaders, parents, and so forth together in a room, having some articulate high school students in the room helps keep all us adults focused on the fact that we're here for kids, not to debate adult problems. Hmm. That's that's who the it's for ultimately, right? Um, changing gears like a little bit. Uh, and I don't want to make it too morbid, but did, did we learn anything good out of COVID? Uh, have we changed things for better, or for worse, or was it just something we're all trying to forget? I mean, I know it's not over, but you know what I mean. Having your kids at home for a year and a half learning on a computer is, was brutal, at least in my house. So, Oh, I don't know. what did we learn from COVID? I think they learned a lot in that, I mean, students need to be in the classroom. Teachers add value. Interaction with human beings adds value. Um they learned a lot about like, you know, as far as buildings go, air conditioning systems and filters and the impact of those, if any. Um, I'm not sure they were as impactful in the long run as they initially thought they would be. I think COVID was more an emotional, social <laughs> exercise experiment. I don't know what than um, than around like facilities. Um, 
See, I just I'd heard, you know, people say, oh, we're going to design in case it happens again. And yeah, and I think that like, air filters, like the big, like, the big you know. thing, they were like, we got to put in more air filtration or these HEPA filters or, <laughs> and I'm not sure there was a lot of evidence in the long run that it really, it really huh. made many changes. Yeah. I was going to say, just, just like in terms of what, what did we learn? Like one of the big things Jessica hit it on, I would just say, we absolutely need our schools open because when our schools close, everything changes. You know, that is so essential uh, just for parents and adults to keep, to be able to earn a living mm, yeah. um, day to day. Then we saw after kids came back that online learning for most kids is not cutting it. Uh, huge detriments that we've got to dig out of. And it's not a detriment in a, in a number sense, it's kids learning kids are way behind in many cases and those with means have caught up and those without haven't and it's really perpetuated inequities in our schools uh, that we pay for on a human level human cost level and we're going to pay for financially if we don't find ways to invest to catch them up has that gotten into the funding discussions to say hey Remember how terrible it was when your kids didn't have a school to go to and how much it was, it was, and does that help with funding or do people just. To be honest with you, I haven't seen that. No, okay. we haven't approached it that way. Yeah. I love it for that to be true. Again, part of the education that's just lacking out there that we try to work on is yes, somebody needs to take care of these schools and you're paying for it because the federal government doesn't unless unless it's through FEMA and it's in a, a, a disaster. Federal government doesn't do anything outside of FEMA mm. or DODIA, the Department of Defense. Mm. So you're left with states, but still the lion's share in most cases has to, comes down to the local community and what to fund for it. And um, we try to just communicate that fact. And then also the fact that there's no zero cost option. If you do status quo, that's what we're working with right now with several of our clients is modeling the cost of status quo. If you keep on funding at the level that you're funding, you're going to pay for it in the coming years. You may be able to scoot for the next few years, but it's coming due. And if we can invest now in a strategic sense, you can avoid making emergency funds, which will be less strategic and more expensive. Some of the big things that geographically you've seen is California, uh, largest school, school number of schools in the country, obviously, largest school population in the country. A lot of the schools were designed in California with an open air model. Mm -hmm. The hallways are outside. Mm -hmm. And that was designed to catch, you know, the, the wind and the wind would act as the, as the air conditioning, right? So they didn't have AC. A lot of the buildings were designed that way. Well, now, not only from a, a climate standpoint and temperature, do you want the air conditioning units, but from a safety and security standpoint, do you want 400 entry and exit points on a, on a yeah. high school campus with a hundred outbuildings? We've seen that, you know, that that's challenging from that perspective. So you've got sort of a, a history of design that saved money and really utilized the climate. And at the time, both the social climate and the actual weather climate, it's, that doesn't really fit. Then you've got places way up in the north. You didn't have AC, didn't really have a need for that. Well, now you do, because for, you know, beginning of summer, you know, into spring, it's too dang hot. Um, but the security thing and the air conditioning, air quality, uh, those have had, you know, real regional, um, those vary by region and, and have, um, brought some significant pain points to the fork. And then how do you fix that? You, you, you fix that in California by rebuilding and that's uber expensive or by creating bunch of perimeter fencing. And then how do you do that without making it look like a, quite frankly, a prison ward? 
Uh, I mean, do you guys want to say anything about school safety, how that's changed? No, we can talk about that. Well, even, even does that, is that a motivator for some of the funding? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Perception of safety and perception of quality. And it's, it's key to use the word perception in both of those is what drives parent choice. You know, the big things there's, there's lots of, you know, what, what's your, What's your strategy to deal with the awful and fortunately statistically unlikely example of a active shooter, right? When you talk school safety, that's the one thing that comes to mind. Well, uh, for most people. So what do, what do you do for that? You need perimeter security and access control. You need to be able to control who comes in the campus and who gets in the door. The big thing from a school safety standpoint to, to consider in these investments that we try to work in is the day-to-day -day safety security needs of a school are far beyond preparations and prevention of active shooter. It's creating a school climate operationally and physically that um, helps bring people together in a positive way and sets up, prevents bullying, for example. You know, mm -hmm. bullying is another key word today. Most of the school incidents, security incidents in a school happen in transition periods in the hallways. So in, in new design, how do we make it so that you have transparency in the hallways? Um, so that you can, people are always on display, learning's on display moving between rooms are on display. So there's accountability, Stu teacher to teacher, student to student, teacher to student. Um, and that is, you know, what, what ultimately when we walk into schools that sort of have that emotional, this feels great. When you say that in a school, it's because it's open and you can see. Mm -hmm. And where one of the things that we get into is when we talk about the, that reality, you hear that, yeah, but that's how I'd like it. I love that openness and to be able to see everywhere. But what about active shooter? Well, if you're contrasting, we need to make sure that you can't see anywhere in a building and it needs to be closed off so that in the horrible, unlikely incidents of an active shooter, the active shooter can't see around the building. You are trading that for in my daily, in the daily lives of every kid for decades to come and teachers, we're going to not allow them to have this open, warm, inviting space. So it sounds like, you know, Ben's basically saying it, it probably gets people's attention. I mean, it's got to be top of the list when you talk about this kind of stuff, but ideally you're basically saying you're trying to build some sense and logic into it because statistically it's unlikely. doesn't mean you shouldn't plan for it, but it sounds like, you know, you guys can introduce some logic into how they address that concern, but without, like you say, making it feel like a prison or letting it be the driving force in a discussion, because to your point, it is, you know, reducing bullying in the hallways, um, you know, making spaces feel more open and friendly, that kind of stuff. So not to belabor, but, Look at their new design for the, the replacement school for Sandy Hook. It's beautiful. Hmm. It's intentionally designed to be inviting and open. The safety elements are there, but they're subtle. It's not in your face. You don't walk into a lockdown like situation where you don't feel that as you as you go through that building. It, and I have not physically walked in that building, but I, you know, um, sort of done virtual tour kind of thing and, and read through the, the design logic and from the architect to the team working on it. And the community was an adamant, we're not making a school that doesn't feel and look like an act like a school. That's your number one job to make a place that acts and operates and feels like a school. And you can do the safety things in, in that access control, perimeter control, and still have an open, inviting environment that, quite frankly, 
if you're doing that right, <laughs> the open environment, the safe, the, the, the nurturing environment, you should ultimately prevent some of those more terrible behaviors, or at least mitigate some of them. Not all of them, of course, but some. You know, whether it's comfortable or not, it's an important subject that it's a reality. We just can't stop being a school while we face that reality. We have to remain a school. Yep. Well said. So many of these conversations that we have, you run into all these things you're talking about, politics, funding, government, you know, all kinds of different stuff. And frequently the pivot is, is well, that's really challenging. So we're going to try to use technology to catch up. Is there any technology in your world that can help in a, in a similar fashion where you're not having to rely on, uh, you know, you're not having to deal with funding issues or emotional attachment? Like, do you have a little bit of an exit plan where you can infuse technology to help or? Yeah, do you, I don't, well, the only thing I can think of, it, but it costs money is you make your building smarter, right? You have better control over your HVAC. You turn things on and off. Um, you don't yeah. cool us school on the weekends. Um, it saves you operational money. Um, school um, at its essence is analog. You know, it, you know, you can, you have digital tools that can expedite finding information, but who's going to synthesize that into something meaningful. Who's going to relate it to me as a kid, to something I can understand a human. We do an exercise, Jessica and I will start out many of these larger processes with what we call a futures conference. And one of the, the exercises is, and we've done this with small town USA, largest districts in the country, um, East Coast, West Coast, rural, middle, big city, every, every place in between, suburbs, you name it. Same exercise, same questions. And to this particular question, we get the same answer every time. The question is uh, to sit around the table in a group of four to eight. And these are these are usually the leaders of the district, leaders of the community. These are your, your movers and shakers in the town. Um, what was the most meaningful class that you've ever been involved in as a teacher or a student and why? And they all sit around it, meaningful, impactful. They sit around and they tell each other these stories and somebody writes down the keywords. They all get up and say the same thing. Teacher XYZ developed a really positive working relationship with me and inspired me to be as excited about this topic as he or she was. That's the core answer. And there's variations on that, but that's the core answer. That's a human relationship that happens in a certain space at a certain time. And everything we do from a facility standing point, standpoint is to facilitate that relationship. If I don't have enough resources in my school to, um, to deal, to help kids who are coming in with bigger problems, then I don't like lunch today, you know, then as a teacher, I'm going to have a hard time building a relationship with a kid who has many other needs that they need addressed before we can sit down and talk about math. And so technology in schools only is there to facilitate a human to human interaction. But at the end of the day, we will always need these buildings. We will always need these spaces because that is the the vessel which these relate in which these relationships happen. Okay. Well, I mean, it, you're definitely both of you are painting a, a complex picture of, of a, a interesting mix of emotions that I think, you know, anybody that was and you're right, anybody that's a student or a parent or a teacher, I think understands what you're talking about, David. They, I, we all have good teachers that inspired us to to do well and hopefully the facilities help foster those relationships. Um, so I think it's a it's an interesting mix of data and infrastructure, right? With human emotion and human connection. And ideally you're setting up the infrastructure so that those connections are there. Um, so I think that's a probably a positive note. I know we don't have a ton of time left, but that's kind of a like a positive note to to consider. And it's it's cool to see that we have folks internally working with communities at that core level 
to fund something so important, even though it is sounds like a pretty big minefield of challenges. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, you know, politics, you know, safety, but they pay whatever, us all the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, but usually when we, uh, we try to wrap up on something that's um, like, what, what do you upcome? What's coming up that you're interested in, whether it's a project or a client an offering a conference, like Jessica, is there something in the near future on your horizon that you would like well, to share? With the we have a big pur- pursuit out there for a statewide assessment that we're waiting to hear back from. So um, that one's pretty exciting for me. I actually did it six or seven years ago when I was at a different firm. So going back and working with an, another client and across the state will be exciting. Um, so hopefully we'll win that. Um, so hopefully a big award soon. On hopefully, the, on fingers crossed. We've been working hard on it, you know, <laughs> all that priority pursuit and middle game and all that stuff. So hopefully we'll get that. Um, I know David has some big ones out there too. Anything interesting yeah. on your conference front in October, or November? Yeah, we, we go to a conferences typically we we like to go to the um, council for the great city schools so these are the 70 largest urban school districts in the country that's been a consistent one for us to go to and that's always interesting I mean, all of these challenges that we've talked about they're dealing with in spades and that's um it's a it's a great group uh, of folks who really uh, are responsible for um sort of on a per capita basis like the the lion's share of our kids' education, especially in these urban settings. Um, and then the National Council on School Facilities. Um, so that's in DC again this year. We're looking forward to that. Um, and that's working with the state education facilities directors from around the country. And I'll tell you, like, from an exciting standpoint, looking, it's November of 24. For us, we're looking at amongst our clients. Um, the exact number to be determined, but several billion on the bond, on the election, uh, in the election for bonds um, levies to help fund some of the projects that we're uh, putting together with these districts. So it's uh, it's always exciting to to build these plans, work with these communities, put it up the ballot, try to help them communicate the why and the need, and then cross your fingers on election day. So get out and vote, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, uh, thanks for your time. This has been an informative discussion. Um, Being legitimately honest here, things you you don't think about, I think the average person doesn't think about, and it's probably a good little call to action to have people show up to the school board meetings and to truly consider these bonds that are on the ballot. It's not just, well, my taxes are going up because as you guys have, well, as we all know, schools are important and you've shed some light on a lot of things that have to be considered to make them run successfully. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you.